Do you want to introduce us? Yes. No, I didn't to answer that question when you emailed it to me. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division with my lovely partner. Donnie Jokum. And we are coming to you live from Chinatown, New York City. And we have our readers joining us from San Francisco and New York City. Um, so we're very excited to start tonight. I oh. should say, what? I'm going to go. I Brontes was yeah, Brontes uh, Purnell will sadly not be joining us. Um, he is currently rescuing a pot farm in Northern California. So say a prayer. Uh, I hope I mean, he's okay. Uh, no, but the thing's going to catch on fire. I really hope he's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, scary times, but we're hoping he's okay. Sorry he can't join us. Um, so, what did I want to say besides welcome? I want to say that we are continuing to have online events, even though we are currently closed. Our space is closed. And um, the center, the LGBT Community Center in New York, which is our home, is going to remain closed at least for the rest of this year of 2020. And we're hoping that they'll open so that we can open early in 2021, but stay tuned in these exciting dynamic times. Um, we do now have an online store where you can purchase Julian's book and David's book and several other books. And we're gonna keep adding to our inventory. So please visit that. That's on our website, bgsqd.com. And now I'm gonna introduce our first reader, Julian K. Jarbo, the author of the collection, Everyone on the Moon is Essential Personnel. There it is, the beautiful cover. More of their work can be found at juliankjarbo.com and on Twitter at Julian K. Jarbo. They live in Salem, Massachusetts. Oh, but you're in San Francisco. No. No? Where did I get that from? I don't know. <laughs> I don't really get California, like the concept, but... Maybe it's the long hair. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Welcome from Salem, Massachusetts. Yeah. <laughs> Please put your hands together for Julian. Um, yeah, I am. Um, actually, I just got this today from a local shop. I'm going to show it off. This little thing has historic buildings of Salem all over it. So now I'm a slutty county um, for real. Um, oh, I can see comments. That's good. That's a better way to talk to me because I definitely can't see everybody's video. Um, yeah, so I'm going to get started. And um, I do want to say that uh, because he couldn't make it, um, if you uh, don't know Brontes' work, you really should check it out. He's got a book coming out soon. Um, I think it's called 100 Boyfriends. Is that what it's called? His novel? Um, and I was just being annoying when we were doing um, tech check uh, and, and saying that one of my favorite books of all time is by him. It's called Johnny, Would You Love Me If My Dick Were Bigger? Um, and it's disgusting and it's one of my favorite things I've ever read. Um, so in the spirit of um, bad representation and problematic faves, I'm gonna read an excerpt from a story in my collection called Self Care. Um, that's also about Catholics. I hear people are talking about Catholics a lot again. You know, they're in the news again. Um, yeah, no, sorry. This is good. Sorry. <laughs> this is going to be the fun part of being Catholic. Um, or whatever. <clears throat> so this is, um, an excerpt from self-care. Fuckos in this stupid town think nobody notices how when the tide just keeps coming in without going out again, that some neighborhoods get sunk forever is an unfortunate side effect of coastal flooding, while others become the sexy, hip, cool, new seafloor village. I cackle every time some bullshit golden brick seawall crumbles and takes another mansion with it, but now there's straight up underwater house tours for a zillion dollars a ticket. The same way they used to show off their giant Christmas trees and shit, but even more pretentious, because now I guess they host in designer scuba gear, 
Oh, this old thing? Blub, blub, there's sand in my butt. No, wait, it's diamonds. Ha ha. That's how they talk, probably. Meanwhile, where my shitty old apartment used to be is now an undersea goddamn hotel and casino. It's a cute little dome bubble park and fucking everything. Like, imagine if when the Titanic sunk, they were just like, fuck it. We'll make it work if we can disappear the poor people corpses. We have got to make back our investment somehow. And everyone was just like, oh my God, of course, that's so important. So I got to know some of my favorite sidewalks for a bit. Because wouldn't you know it, extreme weather means something else entirely when you live outside. It's like, yeah, it gets cold and hot at the wrong times if you're some kind of child prince who's going to cry to daddy if you don't get snow when you go skiing and sunshine when you step foot on your yacht. <laughs> Bite me. You want wind in your sails, hucko? I can tell you all about the wind. I had sex with this guy in a parking lot one night and something broke the sound barrier as he climaxed. And it was just as likely some freak climate event off the fucked up ocean as it might have been a supersonic cum fart. It was cute though. He was like, what? And are you okay? Which was sweet of him. And we didn't exchange names or anything too personal. But honestly, it's good to know there are still some gentlemen around here. It's summer and it's freezing. And sometimes the clouds pick up debris or something falls from a drone or a plane or whatever is happening up there. And there are heavy metal balls of fleet or oily raindrops that catch fire as they fall. <laughs> bon voyage. I had a premium spot in that parking lot too. And everything was fine until clearly someone snitched and an auto plow swept by and took all my stuff away atop a rolling conglomerate of rubble like a garbage fairy's trash sleigh off to deliver bad luck to all the world's ugly children. My cover was blown and I could only sleep in the stockroom at Fatima's Psychic Emporium and t-shirts between clopening shifts. So yes, I did eventually have to stay in a church, but I am still a witch. Our Lady of Good Voyage had a stupid mandatory intake process with this whiny-ass support group. The facilitator's name was either Apollo or Olive Garden. We went around and did our little introductions, but it escalated into feel-good therapy shit faster than any street hustle, and I wanted nothing more than to get kicked in the teeth listening to it. Everyone talked like they'd invented feelings. This one person was so hung up on not suffering enough to feel like they could really call themselves marginalized, and Apollo or Olive Garden was like, Blah, blah, I affirm that your identity is valid. And I said, excuse me, but if anyone would like to make me feel valid, I will be passing around this fully compostable coffee cup I found for direct fucking donations. Apollo or Olive Garden told me to step back, i.e. shut up. So I called them all tourists and I kicked over my folding chair and tried to escape. I was making to leave like, fuck it, fuck this, Fuck you. I'm flinging myself into the sea. She can fucking have me. And they took it so seriously that the priest got involved blockading this exit and asked me if he could help me in that way that store security always asks if they can help you when they think you're going to steal something. The facilitator was all, where do you think you're going? And I shouted to get kicked in the teeth. Why not? It's free. And it beats joining this coma collective. So the priest made me go to his office with him. And I was like, what? Are you going to give me detention? Does this go on my permanent record, father? He just smiled like a little lap dog. And he said he'd been called by God to serve where the need was greatest. And I said, that's what I've been trying to say. I have a lot of needs. <laughs> he laughed. Yes, I can see that. He was short and swarthy, sort of hot. Dude had very hip, canary yellow glasses and these eyebrows for days, and way too tidy a beard for an ostensibly celibate heterosexual. His office door said Father Gasprin in an extremely serious font, and inside there was a human skull on his desk, which really took me back, and a television with a wrestling match on mute, and a framed print of the praying hands emoji on the wall, and that's when I was like, Oh, he's a cool, accessible priest. Okay, sure. We had a little chit chat about my situation. And he had the sheer audacity to say, that sounds awful. It was that practiced, calm, do-gooder, care worker voice I hate. Fake as hell. 
if you want to witness my anger, then get angry alongside me. Father Gasprin kept asking me things like, what does community mean to you, Anthony? And I said, isn't that your job? I knew about group solipsism and infighting and cults and love quadrangles and underground scenes and mutually assured annihilation. But I did not know this community queen. Never heard of her. Now, more than ever, is the time to join our community of mercy and compassion through Christ, he said. <coughs> you don't have to lie to him or to me. There's no gatekeeping here. No shareholders and no research study. No academic thesis. You get help no matter what. I called bullshit. It was not exactly my first time dealing with priests. I look like the exact type of person who gets excommunicated. And I enumerated my many good reasons to be suspicious and how I ran away from Sunday school and became a gay transsexual witch. Well, we don't refuse any type of person, he said. Then he slipped right into the scam. I could stay on the on-site dormitory for free in exchange for a bunch of chores. And also I had to come to mass on Sundays, but there were donuts and coffee. I asked him if the donuts and coffee were also free. And he gave me this satisfied nod. <clears throat> and I realized that by asking a follow-up question, I'd admitted defeat. God had me in their clammy hands once again, like some huge cosmic joke. But I was also impressed by the power move of the whole thing, which only goes to prove that I am the pervert they always said I was. But there is always a catch. However, he added, and I gave him every nonverbal way I have of saying, called it. If you expect relaxed attitudes around sexual ethics, I'm afraid you'll be disappointed. There will be no cruising or turning tricks or back alley activities allowed. He gave me that swollen look like he wanted to do some random acts of kindness at me, which is a thousand times worse than every rival witch's evil eye. The real creeps in this world are optimists. He took me to the dormitories and I guess it made sense to have us do chores because nobody there was about to fill the coffers. The group bathrooms and makeshift kitchenette with all the knives and the matches and a locked pantry and the sweaty asbestos musk of old linoleum floors meant I just knew, without even asking, that I was going to be told when to eat and sleep. The bedrooms were gender segregated, but for some reason, I ended up sharing with the only other transsexual, even though we were going different directions. The reason was transphobia. She was this tall, beautiful butch with stone gray eyes named Bert, short for Roberta, which she said in one breath with no inflection. <laughs> she told me that she was a trucker, even though there are only ex-truckers. I said I was a witch. And she snorted and asked, like, with the pointy hats? And I said, yes, even though I do not physically own any kind of hat because it was still emotionally true. The church always gets its cassocks in a twist about witches, but witchcraft has all the props I do like about religion that I first acquired in church anyway. One, singing and chanting in dead languages. Two, lighting things on fire. Three, impractical headgear. <sighs> ain't spiritual, ain't agnostic, ain't open-minded, Bert said. Don't wanna hear about no gods or masters or mystical woo-woo. Ask me my sign and I'll never talk to you again. Oh, I would never ask, I said. I know how Scorpios need their privacy. For an eternity that passed in the next minute, I thought that she might kill me. But then she spat out this big laugh and said, oh, it's on, witch. And said witch exactly like she meant bitch. So I decided that I liked her. I traded her a Percocet for cigarettes and that sealed the deal. Trans solidarity is fucking beautiful. <clears throat> we went outside to smoke. Everything on the grounds was crammed together on a slip of a sandbar with a dormitory and a shed back towards mainland. And this menacing black lighthouse called the Sinsier, the far rocky precipice of the sea. One more big hurricane 
the whole place was obviously going down like a frown. The church itself even looked like an overturned ship with this massive wooden arch and stained glass porthole windows. Once upon a time, people made boats and buildings this close to the water out of wood, which seems insane because I'm pretty sure wood melts. Bert and I sucked through half a pack and watched the waves flop on the thin, clumpy, petrified beach until the flaccid support group got out and dispersed like an infection. Apollo, or Olive Garden, looked at me like and started to come over. They waved and smiled in the way of sick, confused little children who run back towards conflict because it gives them meaning. And I thought, what the hell? Life is short. Treasure moments of radical vulnerability and speaking my truth. So I tossed down my cigarette and I flipped them off with both of my hands. Bert and I got to talking some more. We had very different kinds of terrible lives and not really too much in common. But she never once called me valid. Thank God. And that's why we were best friends. Thank you. Sorry about the coughing, I fall out of <laughs> Thank you, Julian. Excellent. <laughs> All right. David Pratt is the author of four novels, including a Lammy Award winner, a book of short stories, and several theater pieces. He's performed at Dixon Place, here and other venues in NYC, and at The Forge in Detroit. He is currently collaborating with Michigan artist Nikki Williams on a series of 16 zines, collectively titled The Book of Humiliation. Please clap, hands up, applause for David Pratt. Yay. David Pratt also just recently wrote a whole essay about how he hates bios. Uh, writing, submitting, attaching, revising. Um, but thank you, for, I, I thank you very much for the introduction. It's sort of interesting to hear, to hear the bio. I just wrote this thing. It's going to be in the Book of Humiliation shortly um, about how I don't like to write bios anymore. Um, so thank you to the Bureau, to, uh, to Greg and to Donnie for hosting us here. Um, and thank you, Julian, for, for joining us. Um, I forget where I first saw Julian's book, but the title drew me in. And you know, what I read about it drew me in. So I ordered it, it, it came in the mail, I sat down, I read the first line of the book and I literally out loud said, holy shit. Um, and there was no one in the house. And I don't do this often, by the way. Um, and I sort of had to get up and pace back and forth a little bit before continuing. I was just, Please may the rest of this book be as wonderful as the first line, um, and it was. And so when the opportunity to read at the Bureau came up, um, I thought immediately of Julian, and they were indeed able to join us. And so um, this is a very special occasion for that reason. Also, uh, finally, I would like to thank my host and stage manager, Rosemary Sharon. It is her apartment that I am in, not too far from the Bureau guys, or from the Bureau itself, closed though it may be. We are in Tribeca. Um, uh, and Ro has very kindly set me up with everything. She said, you know, do you need water? Turn your cell phone off. Um, so, uh, so here we go. The new book that I have out is called Two Plays, uh, The Snow Queen and November Door. They both feature the same two characters. They are really easy to produce. If anyone's looking for an LGBTQ play to produce, they have very plain sets two characters each and it's the same two in each one and you know no chandeliers or anything like that. Um, the Snow Queen um, uh, is actually adapted from a short story that I wrote and it still kind of reads very much like one so it's very appropriate for a reading like this. One more uh, thing that I want to say is if anyone in registering um, has not yet made a contribution to the Bureau please do consider it. Um, as these guys explained, they're in a difficult position about reopening because the LGBTQ Center has to reopen before they can. If it doesn't, they don't. Um, unlike other businesses that can make that decision independently. Um, and they do provide, even online, um, a, a space for queer creativity um, that sometimes can be very hard to find in this world still. And so there's very valuable service that they perform and a very wonderful place they have, which I hope you will visit when it reopens. And so please consider supporting them. Uh, so 
as I say, it's very simple. You just need to picture um, a kind of threadbare oriental rug, very old, and two chairs. And pretty much um, everyone else, everything else will become apparent through the words of our narrator, who is um, an 11 year old boy. And this is about a friend he made when, when he was 11. Joe Osborne had big shoulders and short black hair and bangs. Her father, Dr. Osborne, had delivered me, but he was dead by the time all this happened. My parents introduced me to Joe one late winter Sunday in 1968, up in the church choir loft after the service. She shook my hand, she raised an eyebrow, nodded once, and smiled like we've been friends a long time. Pleased to meet you, sir. Care to give me a hand putting back some hymnals? Sure. Right away, we started inventing these jokes, like pretending we were stevedores loading a ship. Hey, ho, ho, hey, ho, ho. Hymnals, hey, ho, ho. Afterwards, I was leaving with my parents. I tried to get over next to mom, so my dad and my brother Russell wouldn't hear. I said, that was a woman, right? Mom shushed me. She might have looked at dad. He was chuckling. He gave me this kind of punch on the shoulder, called a love tap, I guess. What? People might hear you, mom said. She gave dad a look. We can discuss it at home, but we never did. The next week after Sunday school, I ran to church and up to the choir loft. Somehow I knew it was always Joe who put away the hymnals. I was afraid I'd be late, even though it was just 11.05. I was also afraid I'd have to introduce myself again, but well, hey there, sport. Hi. She acted so happy, like I was her old friend and, and we always did this. Come to do hymnal duty again? Yep. She hadn't even started. Wonderful. We can start over here. We'll skin and dress a hundred of them and be back in port in time for supper. Did you know in whaling days, they cut the whale blubber like pages of a book and call them Bibles? No, it's true. So how's life been treating you since last Sunday? Math class still as boring as it was in 1492? Oh, <clears throat> I mean 1942. She was so good to me. It was almost like she understood the thing about me, how I couldn't be like other boys, no matter how hard I tried, including my own brother, Russell. But Joe didn't mind the weird way I was. She was different too. She did look and act kind of, you know, like a man, but she was funny and nice and after a while, the way she was made more sense than anyone else. While we put the hymnals in the racks, Joe told me about her favorite hymns and her house up on Coe Hill in the meadows out back. And then we put away the extra folding chair she had set up for the choir, and finally my dad had to come and get me. Mr. You, sorry, guess we lost track of time. You have raised an awfully fine helper here. Would you folks mind if I offered him a few shekels to help me out with some chores this afternoon up to the old manse? Joe meant her house. Dad looked annoyed, not like the answer was no, but like she shouldn't have asked in the first place. He said we'd have to talk to mom. Mom got all anxious, but I said, please. Now sport, if it's not convenient. Joe said she would pay me 25 cents an hour. Finally, mom said it was all right if I was home by four. Four o'clock it is, Mrs. Yu. Working with Joe wasn't like chores at home, but like I just happened along to help a friend. We had these regular jokes. You want to give me a hand here, sport? Oh, very amusing, very amusing. And so helping out on Coe Hill became a tradition. Joe loved traditions. For example, every Sunday she asked, what are you reading, sport? because I like to read so much, stuff other than what we read in school. Another tradition was knocking off work, halt, and going with Joe's basset hound, Moose, in the truck over to the cider mill in Granby. Emergency cider run. 
One time she showed me how to put a new hinge on my butterfly box and she let me keep the screwdriver. My dad gave this to me when I was about your age and now I give it to you. I went home and told my mom, Joe can do anything. Mom said, well, that's good, I guess. Sort of to himself, Dad said, well, not quite everything. And he chuckled. When Dad said stuff to himself, you didn't ask him what it was or what it meant. He'd just say, oh, nothing. In April, at the first church square dance, Joe wore her one nice outfit I ever saw. Gray slacks, a yellow sweater, a white turtleneck, and a tiny silver cross on a chain. She came over to me and said, handsome, sir. Might one hope your dance card is not full? But dad said, I think Steve might like to dance with one of those pretty young ladies over there. Am I right or am I right? Oh, well, you go ahead, sport. We'll see you later. That fall, the day after Halloween, I was walking on the causeway to Wilkinson Academy, where I was going to, where I was going to go one day and where Joe worked as a carpenter. She came along in her truck and slowed down next to me. What ho, Pilgrim? Oh, hi, what brings you out? I told her how that morning, um, you know my brother Russell, right? He hit me with his hockey stick. So I tried to take it, you know, yank it away from him. And the end of it, it broke this vase of my mom's. So she said I was a disgrace. And I said she loved Russell more than me. And then my dad came up and my mom was crying and saying the same thing she always does. Why do I have to be the villain? And she went into the bedroom and slammed the door. So dad said I should apologize. And, and it was kind of awful because Joe was really listening. But I snuck out to go to the hardware store, but instead I took a detour here just to be by myself for a while. What are you up to? Hold on now, sport. Why don't you come around here? Hop in. Now, I want us to rewind the tape a second. I think you really know your mom loves you every bit as much as she loves your brother. Maybe I should give you a lift to home so they'll know you're okay. But when we got up to the center of town, Joe said, Methinks I am getting an idea. She swung into the parking lot by the A&P and Bogle's hardware and pulled up to the phone booth. We got out and I called my house and Joe got on. This is you, Joe Osborne. I found young Stephen, yes ma'am, fit, fit as a viola as we say. I'd like to speak, he'd like to speak to you. I took the phone. Joe stood with her hand on my shoulder. I tried to shrug it away a little, but I couldn't be obvious. So finally, I just apologized. It was funny, mom was real cheerful and talked fast like she was trying to make the whole thing not have happened. It was over real quick and I gave the phone back to Joe. So Mrs. Yu, I'm doing some repairs on my stone wall this afternoon. You know how there's something that doesn't love a wall and so on, or in this case, someone. At any rate, you think you could possibly lend me a foreman for a couple of hours? Yes, ma'am, indeed, by four o'clock. Now, is this boy union? Oh, nothing, ma'am. Four o'clock, yes, yep. Bye-bye now. Tally-ho, Jeeves. We worked for two hours fetching and carrying stones in the field out back of the Osborne place. Someone had toppled a section of Joe, Joe's wall. You could, you could tell it was some guys. It, it just looked violent. Joe, hmm. Who do you think did this? Did this? Oh, oh, probably just frost heaves. But you told mom how someone didn't love your wall. Well, sport, I'll tell you. It's a waste of time and energy blaming. One puts things back the way they were. Hope there isn't the next time. But I knew, and I bet Joe knew too, she just wouldn't say, ever. It was those guys who lived up there, Don Filbert, Jack Wessel, Jack Sheehan. They went to my Sunday school. They were worse behaved than me, but people liked them better. And I kept thinking I should be like them. I should be brave and like boyish enough to wreck stuff too, except never anything of Joe's. I went out into the long grass to fetch a stone. No, sport, sport, don't go down there. There's poison ivy. But I had the stone already. 
When I turned back, I saw something spray painted on the other side of the wall. I didn't understand the word, but I knew what spray painting meant. I gripped my rock and thought of smashing it right down on Donnie Filbert's face. Something the matter, Sport? No. I came back quickly. Joe was looking away from me. She would never think a thing like that. She always forgave. That didn't seem satisfying to me. Forgiving felt weak, like I'd be like a girl or, or disappear completely if I forgave someone. Except being so angry and feeling like I could never do anything about it, that wasn't quite satisfying either. I was about to go for another rock, just one close by, when oh, all hands for an emergency cider run. And we ran for the truck with Moose. When we got home, Joe made hot cider and we had her homemade shortbreads. They were my favorite. She finally got me home, my home, I mean, at 4.25. Well, my mother said, I was worried about you too. Well, no need, ma'am. I've kept a close eye. It's almost five, mom said and smiled. Well, sorry, ma'am. And then the snow came. Thank you very much. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray. Bravo. Hey, David, is, is, is that the story version as opposed to the play version? I, mm -hmm. I remember there was like a narrator that, that the boy narr narr narrated when you did it at, um, at here. Is that how it went? Yeah, this, yeah it's, it's, it's the play version. Um, it's slightly edited. Um, it's also been changed since then somewhat, not in any radical way, but you know, uh -huh. you revisit stuff, you tweak and tweak. Yeah, I do have a memory that the woman playing Joe kind of, you know, did what you, what your character was saying, so. There, 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 was, there, was, there was lots of mining, which, Jane, Jane Lincoln Taylor played the role. I um, did not like mining, but she bravely essayed it. Yeah, she did a great there, job. There, there are no, no props at all. No, no, it's two chairs and a, and a rug. I did her hair. Pardon? <laughs> Ruggiero did her hair. I did her hair. Yes, 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 my husband did her hair. But of course. And mine, by the way, tonight. I, I, hope, the, I hope the product and everything is good. It's the underlying <laughs> cut. It looks a little darker. <laughs> Sorry about the noise. So, do, Greg and Dines, you guys, you guys want to? Uh, yeah. Does Does over? anybody else have any questions or comments that they'd like to share? It does say in the group chat. Ch group chat. How do we donate? Yes, if you uh, go to oh, our I see. bgsqd.com and just click on the menu and you'll see donate. Thank you. You're welcome. And we also, as I mentioned earlier, we now have an online store on the website as well. Um, so David's book is available and Julian's book is available. Um, Brontes's book is coming out in February, so you can pre-order it through us. Um, so we have a small inventory online right now, but we're going to keep adding to it and it's going to grow. So. And, and we are, am I correct, we are setting this up so that people can get their books inscribed, right? Yes. Because you will, you will be, you will, in my case, at any rate, and I, I assume Julian's as well, you order from the Bureau, but you will get it from me with and whatever inscription you want. So I, I think when you place the order, maybe there's a comment section, yep. you can say how to inscribe. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, when you check out, just put in the comment section what you want David to write um, or who you'd like him to inscribe it to. And I will pass that along. All right. I can't autograph anything because I think my publisher prints with a print on demand. So I don't have any books in my house. <laughs> <laughs> but if you 
uh, you know, donate to the center or you're nice to me or anything like that and you message me your mailing address, which I understand is a big risk, so you don't have to give me money on top of that. Um, I do have some holographic stickers of this moon from my book cover. Mm. I have them left and I'll just mail them to you. They look really good on the back of a laptop. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I have a question for Julian, which is, um, were those stories all written around the same time with the idea that they would go together or were they gathered from different eras in your life and writing career? They're from, uh, well, I'm, my life and writing career. I hope my writing career has just begun. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, it's a good question. Um, so <clears throat> this book is kind of the result of, of one thing that was supposed to be like a shorter chapbook collection of mm -hmm. short fiction and um and some newer work and um short chapbooks of fiction are kind of niche more so than short story collections it turns out so i had more success being like it's a full length book <laughs> um, and decided to center it around the title story which was um a story that um, I guess I've been working on for a long time, off and on, um, and it had sort of turned into this novella. And um, okay, I'm just gonna be frank. Part of my decision to like have a book is that no one wants to publish a 22,000 word short story on its own. <laughs> and I was like, I believe in this story. I do. <laughs> Everyone on the moon is essential personnel. I was like, I believe in it. And I think the only way it's gonna see the light of day as if it's in a collection. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that makes it sound really simple and easy, which it wasn't in any way, but that's the like kind of like practical side of how it came together. Um, I know that's not a very like fun artistic answer. <laughs> but it's, a great, it's a great story. The title story is, is really wonderful. Thank they you. All are, but that one. Thank you. I mean, they aren't randomly cobbled together. They're definitely curated. But um, what about what about the the book that you read from? You put two plays together in a book, yeah? Yeah, they um, about a year or so after this, the short story, "The Snow Queen," had been around forever, and it's in a collection of mine called "My Movie." It's the final story. After Jane and I did this, I, I got to wondering what these people would be like many, many years later. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what if they met and what, you know, they meet initially in 1968. So to have them meet again, say in the 90s, it's all basically kind of pre-internet um, or entirely pre-internet. So there's, there's none of this following someone we used to know or, um, you know, seeing the garden and the the pasta dish and the grandchildren of the person you used to know and all that, they have no idea where each other are. And um, Joe is much bigger in Stephen's mind as his life goes on than Stephen is in hers. She kind of, we discover in November door, she's had some big, big issues of her own, um, triggered by, by the friendship with him in fact. Mm. Uh, and so that how would, how would he find her? How would he approach her? How would they talk? What would they have to say each, to each other? And um, it, uh, it turned out pretty well. And so um, I, I wanted to have that published, but you wouldn't, even though the short story had been published, you wouldn't do the second play without the first one. And I, I was also able to, um, the, the woodcut here uh, is by an old friend of mine, uh, deceased, and her daughter made it available to me. And uh, Nikki Williams, who was, um, designed my last book cover, designed this one. He's also the guy who designs these zines that I'm putting out called Book of Humiliation. Um, it was kind of this great meeting of people across time and space. That's awesome. I, those stories, um, relationships between adults and children are really hard to write. Um, and so mm -hmm. I'm really compelled by that. Um, I think it's, it's like weird territory because um, there aren't like 
there aren't like a lot of nuanced cultural scripts for how those go. Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm starting to hear or read a story about a child who was friends with an adult, especially when it's told from the perspective of like, like you can tell that the child's older now and you're hearing like slightly in the past, right? You know that this is going forward towards something. I'm like, Who's, is the adult gonna die? You know, is the adult gonna be like a deranged mean criminal or like what, what's, what's gonna happen? When's the shoe gonna drop, right? Um, and uh, the fact that, you know, that kind of relationship kind of is almost so narrow in the story imagination, um, makes the setup that you that you established um, really intriguing to me because you 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 didn't you know go beat for beat with that kind of a setup. I feel like I feel like he's not going to learn a very valuable lesson after school from her pain. I feel like she's like definitely a person, <laughs> and that uh, his influence on her life is not necessarily going to be like just a sweet kid who is nice to me. Right. So I was um, really pulled in by the, the very subtextual ways that you were kind of almost like rejecting that kind of a setup. Yeah, it's, it's going to be more um, the, I guess this, this is not too much of a spoiler. Um, the damage is going to be done more by the parents in their weird, weird well-meaning way. Um, but yeah, it is, it, it's also, you know, when I, when I wrote this many years ago, 1968 was a little closer. As I read it now, I, I look at the things that were, especially regarding gender and sexuality, kind of the, the best we could do and the best a prepubescent child could do in describing things, but are, you know, just, just so odd um, to hear today. Um, or maybe not. Maybe, maybe such things um, still are said. Um, there's also, there's a, a little more, uh, and I cut out some sections that were Stephen kind of going around in his head about, you know, how does Joe see him? How does he see himself? How does he see her? How does he, you know, this, this feeling that he's not the right sort of boy. Uh, there's more of that. Um, I slashed and burned at the last minute because this is the reading and, um, you keep things moving a little more. Um, on stage, there's stuff you can do to get people through long stretches of text. On Zoom, mm -hmm. not so much. David, yeah. when, did you, when did you write the story originally? Okay, um, 90s. Okay. I, I think this story is probably gonna have its 30, as a short story, it's gonna have its 30th anniversary wow. for a long, as a play, uh, I believe it was 2000, it was 2003, Dixon Place and Here Arts Center collaborated on the Hot Festival because um, Dixon Place was having renovations, so they did everything over at Here. The following summer at Dixon Place, we were in the Hot Festival again with November Door, 2004. Okay. So 03 and 04 for the plays. You have amazing patience. <laughs> Sorry, who, who said what? Uh, Julian said that you have incredible patience oh. with with the world's attention to your work. Like, I'm if if I can't get it out in front of somebody else in like under eighteen months, I just put it on itch.io as a zine. I'm like, I, I want to move on to the next thing. I can't hold this feeling anymore. Uh, <laughs> you have you have like really incredible slow roll. I'm impressed. I, I got the I got the plays out as plays pretty quickly. But because I tend to be a novelist and short story writer, I'm entirely a novelist and short story writer. This felt like some side thing that I did mm -hmm. just because there was my friend Jane and there was Dixon Place and they accepted it. And so and it never occurred to me to publish it or pursue it or send it to someone and say, wouldn't you like to perform this? So they just, they sat there because I was doing novels and short stories the whole time. And then I thought, wait a second, monetizable, um, <laughs> maybe. Um, you know, once there's, once, once there's no more COVID, or, you know, if Joe and Stephen were willing to quarantine together and, you know, sit and sip cider for two weeks. Um, 
Can I ask a, a quick question, just going back to the gender uh, piece? Uh, you know, Stephen is, is sees gender very, you know, one or the other, right? Uh, which is a product of when the story is being told uh, and being 11 as well. But I, I was just, you know, uh, teaching a class not too long ago. And I took, I took a look on Facebook and that I, I think it's like oh, 57 different ways that people identify their genders. Mm -hmm nowadays uh it's an enormous number right so i i, I was just wondering like and I, the questions are just to david for all of us to think about what would Stephen, an 11 year old you know th be thinking in a world where you know you have 57 different ways of identifying your gender only 57 <laughs> well on facebook i'm sure there's probably, there's probably more right blockers are all blockers like ketchup, oh. like ketchup. Yeah, come on. <laughs> but anyway, that was a question for you, David, not me. <laughs> the, the, the funny thing is that, that I, I do wonder, it's, you know, November Door is, where's November Door is 1992. So even then, not very, very sophisticated or elaborate thinking about those things. Um, 1995, Thanksgiving 1995 for November Door. Um, I mean, is is there a is there a third play? Like, I I don't know how I don't know how sophisticated his thinking would get. I'm sure up at least until 1995, he'd be one of those people who would say, "Oh, you know, Joe is just Joe to me. You know, it labels don't matter. You know, um, and that whole idea has been kind of exploded recently." Um, <laughs> I don't know, in interesting. Something to think about. Maybe you're right about. Hmm. Do we have any other any other questions? Uh, I have a question. I was wondering if David could talk just a little bit about the performance and what the experience was like of the performance at Dixon Place. And and for Julian, um, maybe this is a cliche question, but I'm going to ask it. <laughs> does, um, how does like being in Salem in inform your work, if at all? Julian, do you want to go? Uh, no, you, you, uh, you got the first question. We'll do them in order. <laughs> um, the experience that I, I didn't read the piece at the beginning that explains how the staging of the Snow Queen is supposed to work. Joe and Stephen, the, the two actors are completely in their own worlds. Their eyes meet only once toward the end. Um, they, they speak to imagined virgins, versions of each other, even though they, they share the stage. That's not something we ever decided, we just did it. Or I just wrote it that way. Um, because Stephen is remembering you know, there's a sense in which Joe is not really there, kind of, for Stephen, except that she is. So the the reality of it is is questionable. Um, it, it was great doing it because it was one performance only um, for Snow Queen, so everyone was packed in. Uh, the place was packed to the rafters, and, um, and we had great tech help. They had like an amazing, amazing crew. November Door was two or three performances. As it's more conventional. Um, I, I had to eat and appear in my underwear for November Door, and both of those are, you know, problematic things on stage. It's much more about logistics, November Door, as, as most plays are. Sounds very Torch Song trilogy. The first act of that is very one person talking yeah. to the audience. Yes. Yeah, I will, I'll just never forget Harvey Firestick. Oh, Murray, he's touching my hiney. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's like you can see him develop as a playwright um, from through each one. So the Salem question. Yeah, the Salem question. Salem appears a lot in my work um, it, in one form or another sometimes deliberately, sometimes through, you know, the expressive magic of making art. Um, I, 
that's such a big question. Do you want to, is there, is there secretly a little question inside it or was, were you just like curious? No, I was, I was really just curious. I mean, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. It seems like that, yeah, I was interpreting maybe a little bit of that, that like there was a sense of like that space that maybe informed your work and I was just wondering how. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how familiar people are with the parts of Massachusetts and New England, but um, Salem is on the North Shore, is the, is the, um, is the area. <clears throat> and um, let's see. Yeah, I think, you know, it's had a pretty big, it's very apparent in this book, right? It's not necessarily apparent in everything I write, but um, the title story, as well as um, the story that I read from, for example, are uh, both, you know, pretty consciously um, in conversation with some some things about Salem and the North Shore. Uh, I I did an interview with somebody who had turned out to be from Massachusetts, and they were like, "This book has Easter eggs. Is is that what these are?" And I was like, "Sure, yeah. You know, if you're, I guess if you're from the region, there's maybe like another layer there." Um, the part about, um, you know. The decision to write a horny story about climate change from the perspective of somebody who is unhoused um, was very much inspired by here. You know, um, the the shoreline keeps changing. And uh, about two years ago, there was this really awful nor'easter and, uh, and the ocean came all the way up into part of downtown and you could slosh to the bar. Uh, you could swim down Derby Street part of the way. Um, and, and um, you know, that on, on its own is kind of an intense image, but the detail that like set my heart aflame <laughs> is that I was, uh, you know, loitering around on, um, on the flooded wharf <laughs> like one does. Uh, and, and these people came out of the, of uh, the Mercy Tavern. Mercy Tavern is like a liberation theology themed bar, uh, right, on Salem Harbor. So like, you know, you can start to see things adding up. And there's a lot of, you know, neon down by the wharf. And uh, my book is full of neon because I love faded jet age shit. Um, and the North Shore was really heavily, heavily developed kind of like in the jet age and like n mostly for worse, like, in a really messed up way where the, the falling apart pieces are still very visible everywhere. So there's a lot of like faded, you know, diner parts and faded motorist motel parts and um, the consequences of so-called urban renewal are still very apparent. Um, but these people came out of the Mercy Tavern and they were definitely professional sailors because they were the most casual people in the world about water. Um, and they walked out into the flooded wharf and they like, they like summoned a dinghy and the dinghy drove up to the bar. Like it drove up past where you should be able to bring a dinghy because it had flooded. Uh, and it picked up their friends. It picked up these people in, in the dinghy um, from the bar. So they got, they got a pickup and instead of catching a taxi, they caught a boat because of the flooding. Um, so they went back to their ship very conveniently from their night off. Um, and they didn't comment on the fact that their street was flooded. They didn't seem to like think this had anything to do with them because they're sailors and sailors don't have the same worldly priorities as land folks. Um, and so like all of this was just like happening. And, and meanwhile, the town was, was also going through, um, you know, kind of, it's still going through this, but it's going through uh, decisions about what to do with mostly vacant Catholic church buildings, right? So um, there's a lot of Catholic shit everywhere. And I was raised Catholic, so I'm always like, hmm, I know that one. But um, people, uh, the Catholic church isn't as strong as it used to be for some reason. Um, so a lot of these buildings are for sale. And um, you know, there was kind of, there's kind of an ongoing discussion in the town about what should be done with them. Um, what Boston has done with uh, old churches is turn them into luxury condos and they're hideous. And uh, a lot of people really wanted to do that in Salem 
but Salem has been, some people have been trying to push that like, okay, sure, they can be housing, but they have to be affordable housing for old people. They cannot be market rate luxury condos. And like, obviously that's like the morally better choice. But the thing that kind of surprised me um, during all this was happening at the same time, so the flooding and the condos and all this, was uh, how strongly I was reacting to, in disgust, to the idea of turning a church into potentially like private, exclusive, rich people shit. Um, and so a lot of that, um, pro a lot of that real life, uh, I think comes out in self care, where uh, Anthony is, um, you know, when I wanted to write about climate change, kind of, I didn't sit down and think I'm gonna write about climate change, but I was like, who, who actually has the most to lose here, right? Like, um, I'm, I'm really tired of the climate disaster plot that's about like, and then one day it affected the suburbs. I'm like, who gives a shit? Like people sleep outside. There are people that live outside all the time. And like, they, I never see them featured in these kinds of stories. And I'm like, obviously people who live outside um, would um, have a lot more to say about climate change. So I, I wanted to approach it that way. And that dovetailed with the like, or, you know, the possibility that the handful of places where people who sleep outside can go to sleep that isn't outside, like the church, was going to get potentially turned into luxury housing that they wouldn't be able to use. So uh, there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, possible NIMBY happening, and I was having feelings about it, um, and that's like the longest answer ever, but um, yeah, yeah, Salem, Salem is in my, Salem shows up a bit in my writing. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Kevin Beamock, it's gorgeous. It's a beautiful oh, answer. Your answer is beautiful and it makes me want to visit. You should visit, not during a pandemic. But I'm when the pandemic aware. ends, you are all invited to get spooky with me. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Does anyone want to insult us or call us out? I'm open to that too. To what? <laughs> insult us or call us out. <laughs> <laughs> Some public shaming. Whatever. I have, real, I have a real straight girl question. Ooh, um, straight people. Yeah, they exist. Um, I have a one. Hi, you're my first straight person. <laughs> I call her. My oh my God, I'm a straight person too, but I'm not narrow. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to know the straight question. Well, I'm, I ask this because I'm working on a, a, I'm writing a television show that has um, one of the, the two series regular leads is a, uh, refers to himself as a gay man, but there's more to it. It's deeper than that. And it's set in the 80s. And mm. so I've been interviewing a lot of my friends um, who I knew in the 80s who were uh, every flavor, I'm just gonna say every flavor of gay because that's the way I thought of it uh, then. But I'm curious as writers, um, if you feel, no, let me rearrange that. As, as writers in the LGBTQ plus zone, are you most interested in writing for your community and building up your community's, um, you know, oeuvre? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to spread, spread out into just the world so that it's, that gay stories, queer stories are just like Shakespeare or, you know, James uh, Patterson? Do, do you want to come apart? Shakespeare or James Patterson? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not criticizing you. That's the best two examples you could have picked. Well, it gives you an idea of you know how global I'm. I'm, I'm thinking. I mean, is there is there an ultimate goal moving in that direction, or are you most happy talk being amongst anyone you would consider LBGTQ plus folks that you. Uh, more identify with than the rest of us crazy people. David, you should answer that first because 
I um, I was only there for part of the 80s. Well, that's when the show is set, but but I said it then because there was no, you know, internet bullshit, you know, it, life was life. It, it, it wasn't lived on electronics. I, I, I'm interested in writing about what reality has been for me and whoever wants to listen and appreciate can. Um, I generally don't think that um, straight cisgender people, especially straight cisgender men are in any hurry to read anything by a queer person or to feel that they should read anything by a queer person. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, you know, the, the answer to this is very long and kind of exhausting. And it's been a long day, so I'm probably gonna leave it there. Okay, that's cool. I have an answer. Hmm? I have an answer. You go. go for it. Yeah, it depends on who's asking, right? So here's the thing. I don't sit down at my transsexual desk and think about my transsexual thoughts and think I'm going to uplift my people I today. Think not. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, but, uh, and I, and I think the thing to keep in mind is like now as an adult, you know, I deliberately seek out, um, reading and consuming things by people like me, but I think I seek that out as a reader more deliberately than I seek it out as a writer. Mm -hmm. Um, because I'm also additionally, um, reading all the same normie things that everybody else is, right? Shakespeare and James Patterson, yeah. One of my favorite horror books is John Dies at the End, which is like, like, stupid. <laughs> it's a stupid, gross book for 14-year-old straight boys. And I really like, read it in one day. Um, so like, I like stupid things. Um, and I like normal things in addition to all my um, sophisticated and opaque uh, gay posturing but um, the so so there's that right and then there's also the marketing question um, I uh, I think a good comparison I could make is genre right mm -hmm. so my stories are sometimes called science fiction and fantasy because they are science fiction and fantasy but there's a problem with that which is that that's not like a that's not really like a literary description it's a, it's, it's a marketing term and um, the science fiction and fantasy world uh, can be really uh, sealed off from other worlds. And I don't even say that judgmentally. This isn't a, this isn't a quality judgment. This is just true. Yeah, I, I famous, totally get it, yeah. People who are science fiction famous, nobody else knows who the fuck they are except other sci-fi geeks. And that doesn't mean that they're not famous. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so, so there's like that, right? And I've been sort of struggling with that. I'm gonna make an analogy here. I've been struggling with that because for years I was trying to sell short stories in the science fiction market. The science fiction world ha has done one thing very right, which is that there are multiple short fiction publications that pay per word um, and they kind of peer pressure each other into keeping the rates okay um, as, as uh, time goes on. Um, and and uh, meanwhile, uh, the rest of the world is like, pay us twenty five dollars to consider and reject, you know, your your piece, right? So yeah. they fig they figured out that part, right? So there's there's some practical appeal there. But I was trying and trying to break into these markets because I wanted um, I wanted the perks that came with a science fiction fantasy writers of America membership, and to do that, you have to have three pro sales uh, over a thousand words. I have one pro sale over a thousand words. That's a science fiction and uh, fantasy writers of America qualifying sale. And, and I therefore am eligible to pay money for an associate membership that doesn't do me more. Um, uh, and, and, and like, I was just trying and failing, right? And I was like, I actually think my work's getting better and my track record isn't changing. And this has nothing to do with like, Am I sitting down and trying to write sci-fi stories? No, I was sitting down and writing the stories I wanted to write and they had impossible things in them. So I thought naturally this is where I should be sending them. Then I started showing them to uh, literary fiction editors and my uh, career started getting a lot better. Um, and this is why even though the perception is that literary fiction is just jealous of our jetpacks and you know, every time, you know, um, somebody writes a literary fiction novel that uses impossible things in it, 
some critics are like, wow, somebody's discovered fantasy. And, and the fantasy world gets really pissed off because they've been neglected to the margins. And they're like, you don't read our books, so you don't know that this isn't like original. Yeah. I get that. But the reality is like, some of the things that I was doing were being appreciated differently and were being seen in different contexts when I was submitting them as literary fiction. There were people who were like, I don't really get the sci-fi part here. But some of the stuff that I wanted to say that was less, didn't fit into a traditional narrative arc, that was more experimental, that was more crass, that was more voicey, uh, went over better with people who, surprise, surprise, were reading things that were also similar to what I was reading, right? Because most of what I read, uh, turns out, isn't science fiction. It's um, weird experimental literary fiction. So editors who are also reading those things are probably going to like my sci-fi, right? So this is my long way of uh, arriving at an analogy with, you know, do I want to write for LGBT? Okay. Right. No, okay. If I'm, if I'm doing overkill, I'm doing overkill. But um, I really actually tried briefly to avoid marketing this book that way. I was like, I don't want to be a trans writer. I want to be a writer who writes about what I care about. And, you know, that happens to reflect a number of things. And my publicist was like, no, you have, you have to be a trans writer, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> so that's the other part of this, right? So it's not just the publishing and like artistic context. It's also like, oh, if I say this is a trans book and I'm, uh, I'm a brave trans voice, you know, rah, 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 actually that is gonna sell books in a weird way. It's not necessarily gonna present my work accurately. Mm -hmm. right but it's going to get attention and so that's my long elaborate jarbo way of answering your question which is that like yes and no like who's asking and how much are they willing to pay you know well i think that's the thing that i'm finding out as i talk with everybody that everyone's stories are so incredibly different um it, it it's like i was looking through a window pane when really it's a crystal chandelier, you know, in trying to um, write about this world, not from my, my point of view, but from what it was, you know, which I'm doing the interviewing. And it, it's remarkable that I keep learning this lesson that this whole, you know, name something and put it in a box is so useless which is what makes me angry about, you know, this government of what's going on. But because when you really talk to people, they aren't that transparent, if you would, you know, go with the window analogy. So, so I really appreciate that. Th thank you very much. It sounds like you're doing the right thing, which is that, A, you're doing research, but that's not really the right thing. The right thing is that you're talking to your friends. And if you have actual, factual, real life friends in the group that you're writing about, you've already done so much more work than most people who try to do this stuff. Yeah, I have actual and factual. It's almost like one from every flavor, you know? Right. That's, and that's what surprised me is I thought it was one big happy gay family, you know, and everybody goes dances. And no, there's some people who hate dancing. And the whole 70s disco, you know, let's go out and dance until, you know, we don't know which way is up. That wasn't everybody, you know. It's the part I remember the most, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. In, in the gay community that I love the best part. And now I'm finding out it's just as everybody's got their own little things and they hang with the people that likes to do the, the, the things that they do. And, and you, that's everything deep loving relationships that are complicated with multiple members of the group that you're writing about that you're not a part of you'll yeah. probably get it right if you have any adult emotional capacity at all and this is like this is a thing that uh alexander chi talks about all the time he's like please stop asking me about how to get representation correctly do you literally know anyone like this do you love them do you know about the like do you call them in the middle of the night when you're upset like do you understand them as more yeah. than a research project if you can say yes, you're fine. Well, I have and a deeply intellectual reason for writing this television show. And it is that I worked with an actor on Gotham that I adored so much and, and feel so talented that I figured uh, we'll just write something for the two of us. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm so excited. Um, you, I don't know you at all, but I, you should send me your work. Oh, okay. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly let you know. I've almost got a, well, I've got a pitch deck about 75% done, but I've got to go in and throw out four episodes and, uh, and, and get that going. I think getting it right is risky, wouldn't you say, David? Like, do you, has it ever happened to you that like you've actually, you've actually put something really personal and like almost like, almost like pulled from your life authentic? Oh, in this is so much pulled. So yeah, much pulled from my life. And then that's the one that people are like, you, you didn't get it right. Right, David, has that ever oh, happened to you? Um, <clears throat> say something very personal people said to me. It doesn't have to be personal, but you know what I mean? Something you just know to be true yeah. and yours to talk about. I, I, and I've certainly like felt as though things that, that I knew to be true, you know, kind of seemed to go over like a lead balloon. Um, and it, it was, yeah. Yeah, I, I you know, not, not misrepresented, but it's like, you know, here I, here I dredged up this thing and I finally, you know, I saw it clearly and I thought, yeah, this is the thing and this really says it. And there's this kind of resounding silence, which if you're an indie author, you get you sort of get used to. Uh, well, I have some mentors and, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I don't really care that I don't know exactly the rules and, and they are very encouraging. So this was my first shot at it. And now I'm going back to do some work and, and wanting to do more of the research, which is why I thought I'd ask the question I did. Thank you. Does anybody else have any shop talk questions? I love shop talk. I want to know, David, how uh, self-publishing is going, if that's what you're doing. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting because, you know, I did two books of my own. Um, there are a couple of writers that I'm stalking to try to get them to uh, give me their work. And um, so as to expand to publishing others. In the Zine Project, um, wow, it's, um, you know, that, that's where a lot of, you know, extremely personal stuff is going to write, write down. In fact, the two that I'm preparing right now are the ones that I'm like, oh, my God, you know, I'm actually telling people that, that it, uh, in some kind of roundabout way. Um, and that does not depend on sales. There are free subscriptions to 46 people, um, including Greg and uh, Donnie. And let's see, anyone else who's here? Rosemary um, and... Late joiner. The late joiner. Jo jo well, we'll have to talk about that because I'm out of some of them. Um, yeah, unfortunately. We'll see about reprinting. Anyway, so there's 46 people who get them for free, kind of whether they like it or not. And um, so there's no issue of does it sell? Do people like it? It's not going to be reviewed. Um, they don't have ISBNs. That's, that was like a very key thing for me. Is they don't have ISBN numbers. Um, so that's sort of a whole new thing. And that it was not intended to be a COVID project, but it turned into one because we started in February. Um, so it's been sort of what keeps me sane, but it's also weird because artist and writer are working on these things and we don't get to meet very often. We're at opposite ends of town, we have our jobs and so on. Um, and the nature of them is, is changing. So um, I may go back to like stalking one of my authors that I want to publish and, and see how that goes because I have no particular plans for anything book length of my own right now. There's the zines and there's, you know, other people. There's a question for you on the chat. Yeah. For Jindy, me? Jindy would like to know how a person finds out about submitting to and subscribing to your zine and press. press. Okay. Um, so you would uh, write to hostapress at gmail.com. It's just one word, H-O-S-T-A-P-R-E-S-S, -S, hosta like the plant, press at gmail.com. Um, for the zines, as, as I say, we're out, of the, we're out of some of them right now. And it's a whole thing where there's a sequence and there's, you know, um, but when we start reprinting, then we're going to um, see about bringing some other people in. So we would need a, a mailing address for that. And then um, 
something being submitted for consideration would be uh, you can just be can just be attached and described informally. There's no form to fill out. There's no there are no intimidating questions, anything like that. Thank you. Sounds great. Wonderful reading, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I know we've gone a little long. Sorry. No, that's oh, fine. Great. Zoom yeah. hasn't kicked us off, so we're we're good. No, fantastic conversation. It's really fun. Uh, but maybe we should end it there. Yeah. And um, thank you. Thank post you. this recording thank online. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, David, for proposing this and making it happen. And thank you, Julian, for You're joining. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank and you, Greg. Thank, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Julian. Everything. Um, and thank you, everybody who stayed through the Q and A. You all are. <laughs> You're yeah. troopers. <laughs> yeah. Extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So where will be the? Uh... So it'll be. I'll post the recording on our YouTube channel, and I'll share it with David and Julian, and they can spread it to the world. Yeah. Um, so thank you all so much for joining. I hope to see you at future Bureau events online. Uh, go to our website, bgsqd.com, to see it all. As soon as it's safe, I'm going to New York, and I'm going to find a ton of books, and then I'm going to have a lot of sex. It's going to be great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Hi, Ro. Bye, Ro. <laughs> Bye. Hi, Deb. Bye, Deb. <laughs>